a warm welcome again to TOSP, the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf. I'm Amy. And we have another random collection of assorted articles for you this week. <laughs> Indeed we do. Um, we'll be starting out first with, with news that hit the headlines all around the world uh, about the fact that apparently we're, we're inches away from discovering or, or having proof of the fact that Yeti, otherwise known as Sasquatch or Abominable Snowman, actually exists. Um, Reports from Russia this last Monday came out that the foot that um, hair and footprints have been found in a cave, and uh, the footage has been released. So apparently there is going to be a sort of a meeting called between, I believe, ah yes, researchers from the United States, Canada, several other countries, and Russia to to share their research and and stories of encounters um, about it. And apparently we we are just months away from knowing about it. Footage has been taken, uh, even more footage of of its actual existence. I believe it it was in Ohio. Uh, we'll be getting that sometime soon. Um, yeah, mostly this is actually just a bit of a giggle. Uh, one of the Russian spokesmen was, was saying that, you know, when, when we discover them and come to interact with them, we need to think carefully about how we're going to integrate, integrate them into our society, for example. So I remain a little skeptical. I mean, it would be kind of cool, I guess, if we found it, but I'm, I'm not holding out a lot of hope. Yeah, that's the question. Will they fit in hybrid cars and <laughs> how will they adapt to our method of foot breaking? Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's, it's a dilemma. <laughs> On to something slightly more scientific and just extremely cool. This is an article we picked up from New Scientist called Quorum Sensing. Now, Quorum Sensing is when you use a, a group of bacteria to detect um, and some kind of external stimulus. So it could be the presence of food or it could be a presence of heat. And they'll all do something. So they'll emit a chemical signal. What these ones have done is they've managed to make them all... Um, create light when they detect a specific kind of chemical. And usually when they do this, they just randomly flash light, which is all very well and good if you're watching one bacteria. But it turns out that if you get enough of these E. coli bacteria together, when they sense this particular um, chemical, they'll all emit their light at the same time. So you get a whole colony of bacteria acting like a multicellular organism and flashing. And you can use this as a method for detecting all sorts of different things. You just change um, which particular genes are being used. So it could aid with uh, drug delivery and cellular sensors and all sorts of really cool things. But most importantly, it just looks really, really flash. And and uh, what's what's the name for this phenomenon? Um, quorum sensing? Oh, quorum sensing is the, is the general general property, but I'm not sure what the light sensing uh, mm. subgroup of that is. Absolutely. Every time I hear quorum, I just think of um, Star Wars. <laughs> I, I can't help myself. Of course. Why would we think of anything else? Well, well he, the guy, Jeff Hasty, who's developing it, is a bioengineer at the University of California, so wow. it's probably closer to Star Wars than we are here in New Zealand. Fantastic. Very, very cool stuff. Um, the next couple of ones are all to do with space, and they're all pretty short, but they have this sort of like, ooh, wow factor, which which we like so much. Um, space is so good at providing. Space is awesome <laughs> for that. It really is. Uh, the first one is that, and, and I imagine that there will be many of you who go like, what, really? It, this wasn't the case before, but the ISS, the International Space Station, now actually has live access to the interwebs. Previously, what they were doing, um, sort of emails and Twitter, for example, any of you follow any of the Astro Boys like Astro Sorichi or Astro TJ, um, all of that information was being um, sent to and from uh, NASA and the ISS just by an uplink via packets, so it wasn't live at all. But they finally have proper, proper, proper internet access, so... The first unassisted update to a Twitter account came from Astro underscore TJ, which is engineer TJ Creamer's account. <laughs> Do you like his name? <laughs> <laughs> and it said, hello, Twitterverse. We are now live tweeting from the International Space Station. The first live tweet from space. More soon, send your questions. Um, and this is actually really cool because it does give uh, the station and astronauts the ability to browse and use the web in real time, but most importantly, to communicate in real time. Um, and also allows them direct private communications, which are going to help their uh, their quality of life during those long periods away from uh, their dear ones. Uh, apparently, isolation, well, not surprisingly, can be a bit of an issue. So if you want to follow all of them, there's also a centralized uh, Twitter account, which is NASA underscore astronauts. Fantastic. Some of the photos, if nothing else, that come oh, back yes. from them are unbelievable. Um, the second one is very cool as well, also about space. And this is Lenovo, who uh, is a giant, uh, sort of huge Chinese computer giant uh, and the Google-owned YouTube service. And they've gotten together uh, with some U.S. and European and Japanese space agencies to launch the YouTube Space Lab. 
And this is all part of trying to ignite passion for learning science amongst young people. So what you can do, or what students can do, is think of cool experiments that they'd like to try in the microgravity environment on the International Space Station. And then the winning, I believe it's two, will be sent up and will be tested there. This is absolutely fantastic. Also, the six regional winners will be treated to zero gravity flights on, on what many of you may know as the Bomet Comet. But <laughs> they'll get to experience zero G. I, I have to say, I'm, I'm super jealous. And in fact, the, um, marketing sort of marketing guy, uh, for Google for Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, so, uh, one of the men behind this, uh, has said that it makes him wish he was still a teenager because can you imagine what a cool thing this would be to do? And the idea is that the channel will uh, not only screen all the experiments, but will hopefully become sort of a permanent online venue for science-related content. I spoke to an 18-year-old who went on the Vomit Comet as part of one of these particular things yeah. last week, and he was raving about it. He said after his stomach kind of recovered from the first of their multiple parabolas, he was he was raving about it. It was great to see. He intends to go on and become a theoretical cosmologist. Good so it works. <laughs> you know, the system works. It and really, really does. I'm sure that that live uplink to the International Space Station won't be so the astronauts can play Angry Birds. God, no. Of course not. Why would they? Talking of other cool things that one can play on one's devices, though, uh, this is iPad-specific, but I do know that there are a number of, of people out there who either own iPads or have friends who own iPads, and, and you can occasionally wrest the damn thing away from them. Um, I'm a recent convert. Anyway, this is the uh, Exoplanets iPad app. So this is from Scientific American and some various uh, Exoplanet experts. And what they've done is come up with what they're calling a groundbreaking hands-on introduction to the distant planets that continue to be discovered outside our solar system. So what you can do is you can look at a bunch of really beautiful images, uh, mostly artwork. Um, you can visit the surfaces of them. You can build your own planet, which is the one I'm really looking forward to do. You can filter starlight. You can look at stars in 3D. There's an audio uh, tour guide. There's a guided tour. There's a timeline. There's a size chart. There's uh, even you can do little experiments and things like that if you want to try some of the science. There's just a range of stuff that you can do on this iPad app. Um, I promise you I'm not getting paid to tell you about it. I just came across it. I don't know how much it costs. I imagine it's not free. But anyway, worth, worth going and having a look at. I'm going to um, when I get home. Oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> moving at, on. <laughs> at the other size, uh, side of the size spectrum, a new article in Nature this week, and this is seriously cool. So it's looking at the details of Brownian motion. Now, to give you some kind of background, Brownian motion is this weird motion that you see in microparticles, as was originally described by Albert Einstein a few years ago now. Essentially, uh, he describes it as... Now, one of the simpler ways to describe it is imagine you're watching a beach and it's covered in people and they're all playing with one huge inflated beach ball and it's bouncing from one side of the beach to the other. And now imagine that you pull back and you zoom up so the people get smaller and smaller and smaller so you can still see the ball but the people begin to shrink and shrink until eventually you're so far away that you can't see the people but you can see the ball and the ball is bouncing and it's bouncing in quite specific ways because of the direction the feet people are facing. The idea behind this is that we can detect the presence of things like atoms and small molecules by observing their impact on larger objects. And this is the idea behind Brownian motion. So if you watch microparticles under a microscope, you'll see them buzz around and vibrate in all sorts of what are meant to be perfectly random directions. Mm. And this follows pretty standard Brownian motion theory, except <laughs> that the particles actually interact with the liquid that's around them. When you think about it, all liquid is sticky and they have varying degrees of sticky stickiness mm. and how sticky the liquid is controls how much an impact the particle has on the liquid around it and what these um researchers have done is they've used this technique called optical tweezers which is essentially when you get two lasers and you fire them at a microparticle and that light actually manages to hold the microparticle in place and they've measured the vibrations very very precisely of this particle and they've managed to detect the interaction of the particle with the liquid around it because of these vibrations because they're not uniform which is what you'd expect from standard Brownian motion theory and they can now use this as a potential sensor for detecting what's going on on the very surface of this particle how sticky the liquid is and all sorts of other really really cool things and it's only just become possible because they've only just made optical tweezers um, with enough time resolution to be able to detect this so we're to give you an idea of how epically complicated this is <laughs> uh, you're looking at the impacts of individual atoms on something that you can see with your actual eyes it's it's absolutely incredible and it's going to be um 
they believe it's going to become a common technological approach to studying things. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, they they say it in the Nature paper, but I would say that if I wanted to get funding as well. So it maybe take that enough. with a grain of salt. <clears throat> but uh, <laughs> still still very, very cool. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but, but Brownian motion is, is, I guess if you had to think about the microparticles you see most often with Brownian motion, it would be air? Yeah. There you go. 